Good evening, everybody, and welcome in to tonight's program with the Schomburg Library. My name is Chris Corrigan. I am the Adult Programs Coordinator here at the library, and I am so happy to be with you guys this evening as we continue along our journey on our brand new series in partnership with the League of Women Voters of the Palatine area, our Civic Awareness Series. Um, before I pass things over to my friends at the League, Terry and Janet, I just wanted to very quickly give you guys a few friendly Zoom reminders. Your microphones and your cameras have been turned off. So if at any point during the program you're having technical difficulties and you need to communicate, use your q and I'll be monitoring that throughout the program. In case there's an issue, I will be able to go back and forth directly with you there and then your uh, cry for help won't be lost in the chat. Sometimes that can happen. Um, also, if you have questions for tonight's presenter, uh, don't hesitate. Throw those in the Q&A as they're bubbling into your head. But we won't be getting to any of your questions until the end of the presentation. But don't hold them because then you might forget them. So make sure you're just throwing those in there as we go. We also have enabled closed captions if you would like those, and you can turn those on or off as you'd like in the Zoom toolbar. I also do want to just quickly, we'll bring it up again when we get there, but Tonight's wonderful presenter has an interactive program for you, and you will see, uh, just like the poll that came up when you entered this evening's program, you're going to see a couple quiz questions pop up as we go. Now, the quiz questions are all listed together, so you'll see question one, two, three, four. We're not actually going to answer them all at once. We're just going to go one at a time, so only do the question that you're instructed to do, um, and then we'll share out the results of that, and we'll unshare, and we'll reshare, and we'll just do that four times. It'll be absolutely delightful. Um, I, oh, we are already starting with questions in from the audience. Um, currently, it looks like uh, they're asking about today's attendance. It looks like we're at about uh, 40 people right now. Um, we're so excited to, to have this many people with us. And I know that number grows as we get closer to 7.05. So thank you so much for being with us this evening. Um, and without taking any more of their wonderful time, I'm going to pass this over to the League, League, the League of Women Voters <laughs> of the Palatine area. Take it away, Terry. Oh, thank you, Chris. Thank you very much for including us in the Civic Series. We really appreciate it. And um, my name is Terry Gazowski. I am the co-program director with Janet Sinoika for the League of Women Voters Palatine area. Janet's going to be monitoring Q&A along with Chris, and we'll also do some wrap-up at the end. And uh, and I also saw our president, Kathy Cortez. So if you want to slip in a few words at the end also, Kathy. <laughs> feel free to raise your hand. Okay. Um, so a little bit about the league. I just wanted to say that um, we are um, a nonpartisan political organization and anyone can join and support the league in their mission of promoting civic engagement, voter education, and advocacy on various issues. You can learn more about the league and participation through the website that will be in the chat. We are over a hundred years old but we welcome all ages and uh, all genders. The, um, now on to our topic of Beyond Plastics. Presenting today is Jacqueline Kazaza, and um, she is going to school us on the practical approaches and actions to reduce plastic pollutions. She is the president and co-founder of Go Green of Glen Allen, a nonprofit with a mission to help us be greener through education, advocacy, and volunteering. Um, she also serves as an issue specialist on waste for the League of Women Voters Illinois, along with multiple environmental positions uh, uh, within Glen Allen. Her full biography can also be found in beyondplastics.org, which will also be placed in the chat. Thank you, Jacqueline, for bringing us into your community of concerned people of beyond plastics and the effects of them in and on our everyday lives. Welcome. Thanks so much, Terry, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and I'd like to thank the Schomburg Public Library and also the Palatine League of Women Voters for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get going on the presentation. All the way to the beginning here. All right. Does that look good? Yes. Very good. Yes, yes we can great. see it. Okay, great. All right. Well, again, my name is Jacqueline Casaza. I'm here to talk about plastic pollution and community solutions tonight. Um, but before we dive into that, 
let's talk about why we're both here. So for everyone listening tonight as my guest, I'm gonna start with you. Why are you here? Well, I'm guessing that you're here because you have curiosity questions and or concerns about plastics, uh, or maybe all three. I'm going to share as much information as I can today in an attempt to educate and motivate, but not completely overwhelm you on this issue. But this is a big problem and it's going to feel like a big problem. It is okay to feel overwhelmed. In fact, I feel overwhelmed a lot when I think about this problem. But I want you to remember as we chat today that this big problem was not created by any one person. And if you have a plastic water bottle that you're drinking out of off screen right now, um, I'm not gonna ask you to leave. Uh, in fact, there is room for everyone to learn and we're going to need as many people as possible to tackle this problem. I'm going to be throwing a lot of information at you tonight. So if you remember nothing else, I'd like you to leave with three key takeaways about the plastic problem. And because I love alliterations, I've made them all start with the letter P, just like plastic, so you can remember them. So number one, plastic is pervasive and permanent. Number two, recycling is basically powerless against plastic. And number three, plastic is potentially harmful to our health. To help you follow along, I've dropped in reminders of these points throughout the presentation. They'll be in yellow, uh, just like the lovely yellow in my hard hat here in front of this enormous pile of plastic waste. So now why am I here? Well, I have a lifelong interest in exploring our world and its natural areas. When I became a mom and more recently, um, when I started spending a lot of time running outdoors, I became curious and also increasingly concerned about all of the plastic I saw everywhere. I also love traveling and have seen other places tackle reuse and reducing plastic more effectively than the United States. Seeing all this made me a cross between anxious and a little angry. Um, so I decided to channel my anxiety into founding an environmental nonprofit in my community, Go Green Glen Ellen. Our mission is to help local residents and businesses in, Beater, in, in Glen Ellen be greener. Um, I also serve as a waste specialist for the League of Women Voters at the state level, and I'm on the board of um, Mike Glen Ellen uh, League of Women Voters local chapter. Uh, and I also am a speaker um, with the National Volunteer Speaker Bureau with Beyond Plastics, which is a national nonprofit working to end plastic pollution. So um, I spent a lot of time thinking about and talking about plastic pollution. In fact, here is a picture of me talking to my son's class last year with the League of Women Voters about plastic pollution. I guess I feel that the best way to predict the future is to create it. And I wanna create a world for my kids to inherit that is plastic pollution free. But before we can do that, we have to understand this problem that we're dealing with. So let's start with the basics. What is plastic? Plastic is made from fossil fuels and any number of chemical additives. There are over 13,000 different chemicals that could be used to make plastic. And today, almost all plastic is made from ethane, which is a byproduct of hydraulic fracturing, commonly referred to as fracking. Now, I'm not going to dig too deep into fossil fuel extract extraction, uh, no pun intended, um, but I am going to take a minute to um, explain a little bit what fracking is and the role it plays in the plastic pollution problem. So fracking works by blasting large quantities of water, chemicals, and sand into rock formations at high pressure to crack the rock. That allows the once trapped gas and oil to flow to the surface. And a byproduct of fracking is ethane gas. Um, this used to be burned off as a waste product. Now, however, the ethane is captured and is transported to a facility called an ethane cracker plant. There, the ethane molecules are superheated until they crack. When that happens, those new molecules are what is known as ethylene. Um, and ethylene is the base, or they call it um, the feedstock for many, uh, for, or for polyethylene pellets, which is the base of many, many, many single use plastics. So um, the fossil fuel industry has taken something that was essentially worthless and turned it into a new material that they can sell and used to make all sorts of plastic. And we are in the midst of a huge fracking boom in the US and therefore this is creating a huge supply of ethylene that can be sold to make all sorts of plastic and of course, all sorts of money. So here are some examples of items made from plastic. Uh, this is the part in the presentation, by the way, where I show you 
cute pictures of my kids and talk about how useful plastic is before I get into some of the scary stuff. Um, so we all know plastic is an incredibly versatile material. It's durable, it's lightweight. I just said it's very inexpensive to make and it can take on any number of shapes and colors. All these properties have made it very popular. Just think about all of the plastic now we didn't use even 15 to 20 years ago. Almost all food packaging, almost all children's toys, all of our favorite clothing and athleisure wear, athleisure wear that's so um, comfortable made from synthetic materials, that's all made from plastic. There is even plastic in gum. So just how much plastic do we make? Well, this is just one example. We make five trillion plastic bags a year, and that is just one type of item made from plastic. So bottom line, we make a lot of plastic. And the biggest problem in my mind with the way we make plastic today is about half of our production is for single use products. Name anything else that you buy that you throw half of it away after using it just once. We don't treat our clothing, our housewares, our cosmetics, or even our food like this. This is a major design flaw with the way we use plastic because there was my first takeaway. Plastic is pervasive and permanent. It virtually never leaves us. Um, and virtually every piece of plastic ever produced is still on this earth. So you might wanna know where is that plastic? Uh, well, I'm gonna break it down um, with this kind of confusing blob, but I will explain. Um, so this giant blob rectangular shape on the screen represents all the plastic that's uh, ever been produced. And about 30% of it down here is still in use. That's this small blue rectangle on the bottom. And if you think about an airplane, for example, all the plastic components in an airplane, you hope that those plastic parts last a long time. This larger top section uh, represents the remaining 70% of plastic ever produced, which mostly goes to the landfill. That's this kind of large gray blob over here. Uh, a portion of it is burned, which um, I cannot get into tonight, but that presents its own um, environmental challenges. And then this small section at the bottom represents what is recycled. Now, before I tell you how much that is, although you could probably make an educated guess by looking at this small shape, uh, let's do a quick polling question, or I guess quiz question. Chris, could you give us our first uh, polling question? Yes. One second. I just realized I was gonna go like radio silent trying to do this and I didn't wanna like worry anyone. All right, everybody. So the uh, quiz should be showing up right now. You only have to answer the first one. Um, on average, what percentage of plastics is recycled in the U.S.? Now your choices are 5%, or sorry, I think it's on the screen, it shows up uh, 75%, 30%, 10%, or 5%. All right. So looks like those are coming in. Get just a few more seconds here. All right, uh, looks like we have most of our answers. So uh, most people are pretty uh, right on. The correct answer is 5%. Um, so the global average is about 10, per, or sorry, 9%. Um, in the US, the percent of plastic that is recycled is lower. It's only about five or 6%. Uh, and those numbers might seem very surprising. You might be like this confused puppy dog on the screen because um, it looks like when you see things that come packaged in plastic that they should be recyclable. Um, and if you're like me, you've probably spent your whole life convinced that recycling is one of the best ways you can help the planet. Now, recycling is very important when it comes to things like um, cardboard, metal, and glass. However, plastic is a different story. And put simply, plastic recycling just isn't the solution we've um, been told it is for dealing with plastic waste. So first of all, when plastic is recycled, its days are numbered. This is the same chart from two slides ago. I just blew up this, uh, this section so we could see it a little easier. So something like an aluminum can can be recycled infinitely over and over again. A can that your grandparents drank out of 50 years ago, your grandkids could be drinking out of 50 years from now. Um, but that is not the case with plastic. Plastic can typically only be recycled one to two times but until the material is just so degraded that it cannot be used anymore. Um, there is a very small amount of plastic that is recycled and still in use. That's represented by this green circle here. 
Um, however, plastic is really more often downcycled. Um, and what that means is it's turned into a different product. So for example, a water bottle can be downcycled into a pen. This pen was actually made from uh, plastic water bottles, which is uh, great, but the problem is I cannot turn this pen back into a water bottle. And eventually this pen is gonna run out of ink. It's gonna have to get thrown away. And that is the end of the line for that piece of plastic. Um, so that kind of uh, life cycle is represented again with this um, gray landfill bar that's recycled then discarded. But what about the triangle thingy? What about the recycling triangle that we all see? Um, well, what many people do not realize is that this recycling triangle um, is actually not a recycling triangle. It does not indicate recyclability. All it is is a code which describes the type of resin that is used to make a particular plastic. And what is actually accepted for recycling depends upon where you live, and more importantly, if there are end markets for the discarded plastic. So when it comes to recycling plastic, only about two of those codes are even somewhat desirable. So when you and I put our um, recyclables out on the curb and they get picked up by our waste hauler, they get taken to what's called a materials recovery facility or a MRF. Um, and there the plastic and all of our other waste is sorted and bailed up into different um, types. And then someone buys it if they want to make it into something else. So the only two types of plastic that are really desirable um, are number one, which is plastic beverage containers. And number two, which is a little heavy duty or plastic that's commonly used for laundry detergents or milk jugs. Um, sometimes number five, which is common for takeout containers or like yogurt tubs, um, but generally only one and two are the most desirable. And we've all heard this expression, follow the money. Um, well, there's really only money or markets for one and two plastics. Everything else is really not desirable for recycling into another product, um, which means it doesn't generally get recycled. But what about all that plastic that looks like it's getting recycled? Um, again, we've been told over and over again that recycling is the solution to all of our plastic problems. But the reality is that the majority of plastic is just not recycled. So this is a chart from the EPA, um, which shows how we've managed plastic waste as a country over the last 50 years. So you can see that while the volume of waste has increased tremendously, um, that's the total, the amount that's been recycled in this dark blue is small and it's actually stayed pretty flat. Um, uh, much greater is the amount that's being landfilled, that's in the gray here, and then this light blue, um, combustion with energy recovery, which means the plastic is being uh, incinerated. The U.S. is also permitted to ship what's called non-hazardous plastic waste out of the country and label this as recycling. So what looks like recycling can often, in fact, be a practice known as waste colonialism. Um, this is a practice where wealthy developed nations send their waste to less developed nations to manage. But many of these developing countries do not have the infrastructure to handle waste, um, especially at the volume of at which we pump it out. And unfortunately, this practice is not unique to the U.S. It happens with many developed nations that ship waste to these same developing nations. All right, so this photo here is from um, the Blue Paradox exhibit at the Museum of Science and Industry. Uh, it's happening right now. It's an excellent exhibit if you haven't been, and it talks about plastic pollution in our oceans. And uh, it shows from top to bottom the amount of plastic produced in the U.S. every year uh, compared to uh, two much smaller numbers. Even if you can't read the whole number, the number on the top is by far much, much greater than the number underneath, which is the amount of plastic that is recycled in the U.S. and then further under that, the amount of plastic shipped in the U.S. So all this plastic is being produced, a little bit's being recycled, and some is being shipped, and the rest, the majority, is going to be burned, landfilled, or become litter. So you might be feeling a little frustrated right now <laughs> because I get very frustrated when I come get to this part. Um, that's okay if you are, but everything I've said in the last five minutes should clearly demonstrate my number two takeaway, which is that recycling is kind of powerless against plastic. Um, we simply cannot recycle our way out of this problem. And now that we know that there is a tremendous amount of plastic that is no longer in use, and despite what we've been told, not being recycled, you might wanna know, how did this happen? 
Or to paraphrase the iconic Talking Heads song, Once in a Lifetime, well, how did I get here? How did we get to a world where we use over 1 million plastic bottles every minute? It wasn't always this way. Plastic originally wasn't designed for such wasteful use. Now, I just took you back to the 80s with that song reference, um, but we're going to travel a little further back in time to see how this came about. While some forms of plastic and plastic-like materials were prototyped as far back as the early 1900s, it was during World War II that the plastic boom occurred. Raw materials such as metal, rubber, and silk were in short supply. And improvements in chemistry combined with the needs to support the war effort spurred the mass production of synthetic materials. So for example, nylon replaced silk and parachutes, um, plexiglass replaced um, glass in planes, which made them much safer. And then polyethylene and polyvinyl chloride was used in soldiers' uniforms. Uh, with the end of the war, the manufacturers of these materials were looking for more markets in which to bring plastics. What resulted next was a brilliant marketing campaign to bring plastic into people's homes. I mean, just look at some of these advertisements um, that were created about plastic. Plastic makes the perfect gift. Plastic makes my chores easier and um, better to do. Um, and here it looks like I'll even have more friends that want to come over and bake with me if I just bring plastic into my house. I look at these advertisements and I think, man, uh, life is pretty fantastic with plastic. Um, and I'm not as old as some of these ads, but I do distinctly remember a tagline from um, my childhood that was put out by the American Chemistry Council, which is a plastic industry group. Um, and that line was plastics make it possible. So audiences were originally skeptical of using disposable plastic because we did not live in a throwaway society. But getting plastic to move not only into, but through people's homes was a key component of the marketing strategy. Plastic manufacturers use these marketing campaigns to create new markets that didn't exist and increase their profits. And now here we are in a world where our society has reached the point where the effort necessary to extract oil from the ground, ship it to a refinery, turn it into plastic, shape it appropriately, track it to a store, buy it and bring it home is considered to be less effort than what it takes to than what it takes to just wash the spoon when you're done with it. These manufacturers have pushed to expand market share and cheese profits beyond the point of what even makes sense. Who remembers these ancient artifacts? We have a paper tub of ice cream um, with a little wooden spoon instead of a plastic spoon. Here are some glass bottles that are being collected to be reused and refilled. And this is an outdoor beer garden um, with a, a bunch of glass mugs and a refill station and also a mug washing station. Um, but believe it or not, these photos are not from the National Archives. They are actually from my family vacation um, in 2023, um, last summer with my family in Vienna, Austria. So this is how things used to be. And in many places of the world, uh, it still it still happens um, in places that focus on reusables or single use items which are not made from plastic. This trend of more and more pervasive plastic is troubling. Recall that I said virtually every piece of plastic uh, ever made is still on this earth, and yet we are producing more. So plastic production has doubled in the last 15 years and it is expected to double again by 2030. The rate of plastic production is quickly be turning into a runaway train. And while we do need some plastic in our lives, as I mentioned, single-use plastic and especially packaging is by far and away the biggest contributor to plastic production. So much stuff comes packaged in plastic now, we don't even question it. My son's baseball bat came wrapped in plastic. I bought a hammer that came wrapped in plastic. Even things like bananas and coconuts, where nature has made a perfect wrapper for them, I still see those wrapped in plastic uh, at the store. All right, a little frustrated again, so we're gonna take a quick break back with the talking heads um, who ask, once we have our beautiful house, presumably filled with these beautiful plastics, where does that highway lead to? How does the production, usage, and disposal of all these plastics impact us as humans. First, it is important to understand that the production of plastic as a whole is inextricably linked to the climate crisis. It takes an enormous amount of energy to extract fossil fuels 
and manufacture plastics. And once created, those plastics release greenhouse gases at every stage of their life. According to the International Energy Agency, petrochemicals, which is the category that includes plastic, now account for 14% of oil use and are expected to drive half of oil demand growth between now and 2050. And as a world, we are trying desperately to move away from fossil fuels, but plastic is not going to let us do that. Furthermore, this burden is not shared equally. A report from Beyond Plastics found that 90% of the emissions from plastic infrastructure and manufacturing is released into just 18 communities, which are mostly along the Texas and Louisiana coastlines, um, but also increasingly in Appalachia. These communities earn 27% less on average than the median household income and are 67% more likely to be communities of color. Even before plastic reaches consumers, there are adverse health effects in the production and transport of plastic. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, also known as NOAA, tracks incidents um, that take place around our coastlines and waterways. So all these little dots on this map, this is a real-time map um, on the NOAA website, by the way. Um, these are all different incidents. And incidents is a nice euphemism for spills, leaks, and accidents involving oil, natural gas, chemicals, and other mystery substances. Uh, in 2023 alone, there were, were already uh, over 140 incidents and the remediation and cleanup that happens after is often slow or non-existent. These chemicals are going into our water and seeping into our land. Some of you may also be familiar with the East Palestine train derailment that happened about a year ago when five cars transporting vinyl chloride derailed in East Palestine, Ohio. Vinyl chloride is used to make polyvinyl chloride, also known as PVC, which is commonly used in plastic pipes and to make fun plastic outdoor water toys like these rafts. But vinyl chloride is also a known human carcinogen. And that was um, released into this community when this train derailed. I only live about two blocks from the Glen Ellen train station. And since that uh, happened, I've often thought about what would happen in my community if a similar incident occurred. But damage isn't limited to things as big as greenhouse gases or as catastrophic as an oil spill or a train derailment. Plastic litter is choking our parks, prairies, rivers, and beaches. We have all seen these devastating pictures, and it is at levels that are hard to comprehend both mentally and emotionally. Plastic inflicts damage to the health of our planet at every stage of its life cycle. And even though we humans don't get tangled in fishing nets, we are still surrounded by plastic, and our health is also at risk. All right, I think it's time for another uh, quiz question. Chris, could you read uh, question number two? Absolutely. So you're going to see the same poll pop back up. It could be like, re-answer number one. Just skip number one. Scroll on down to number two. Some of you already figured it out. How long does it take plastic to biodegrade? 50 years, 250 years, 500 years, or it doesn't biodegrade? Yeah, so a little hint, if you've been listening for the last 20 minutes, and I said virtually every piece of plastic is still on this earth, uh, Kind of, kind of giving away the answer. So I'll just give a few more seconds there for the other participants to answer. All right, it looks like just about everybody got this one right, um, which is that plastic does not biodegrade. So I'm going to explain a little bit more about what happens to plastic um, since it does not biodegrade. So. What does it mean for us humans to be surrounded by plastic waste? Uh, I'm going to illustrate that again with another cute picture of my kids. So this is my son, Patrick. We are doing a beach cleanup in Michigan. This is a couple years ago and he found a straw. Um, this is near our family lake house. So as I just said, plastic does not biodegrade or break down. Instead, it breaks apart when it's exposed to elements like light, heat, and pressure over time. So here are some examples of plastic fragments we picked up on the beach. Um, there's a straw buried in there. That's like a lid for a drink. Here's a ribbon somewhere. I don't even know what these are, little plastic fragments. And then over here on the right, this is a dime. So you can see the scale of the dime compared to these plastic bits and just how small these fragments are. By the way, I challenge everyone listening tonight to take a walk around your neighborhood tomorrow and I guarantee you're going to find some a fragment of plastic on the ground. Um, a bottle cap, a wrapper, 
um, uh, some plastic cutlery. Uh, and then once you start seeing this around, you will never unsee it. You're always going to find plastic. Um, but at least being able to pick up those items or, or these items we picked up on the beach with my bare hand, it helped uh, or it enabled us to capture these plastics so they didn't wash back out into Lake Michigan or, or stay in the sand. But as plastic continues to be exposed to the elements, it breaks apart further. Eventually, plastic grinds down into tinier and tinier uh, fragments. First, microplastics, which can be the size of a grain of sand, and then to nanoplastics, which are the fraction of the size of a blood cell. We're talking teeny, teeny, tiny. The squiggly ones here in section D, these are microfilaments uh, or microfibers. Again, that's what is shed by all of our like so comfy, cozy, <laughs> synthetic clothing and fleece blankets. Um, but you can see on this slide just how small these fragments are and imagine how incredibly difficult it is to capture these. And in fact, currently we cannot capture them. Uh, microplastics have been found in freshly fallen snow in Antarctica at the bottom of the deepest point of the ocean and really all over the globe. Plastic is ingested by animals or these microplastics are ingested by animals that we later consume. Um, and that is not confined to marine animals. It's also been found in cows, pigs, chickens, pretty much you name it. Um, as it gets smaller and smaller still, it gets into our water and our soil. So here is an image of a microplastic filament that was found on a snowflake and uh, a microplastic that was um, being uptaken into the stem of a plant. So as a result of all these microplastics everywhere, we eat, breathe, drink, and absorb tiny pieces of plastic into our bodies every single day. Microplastics have been found in drinking water, both in tap water and in bottled, though much higher in bottled. And a study just came out about that in the last um, two weeks that they found, uh, the study that they did found nanoplastics at a rate that was 10 to 100 times higher than what they previously thought in bottled water. Uh, it's also been found in the studying of indoor and outdoor air and in food. Um, Chris, I know we just did a polling question, but could you please read the one about plastic in food? Hopefully everyone already ate. <laughs> That's absolutely one <laughs> moment this here. Question. All right, everybody, if you want to scroll down past questions one and two to question number three. Oh, actually, I put these in the wrong order. Forget that. Okay. Scroll all the way down to the bottom to question number four. In January 2024, Consumer Reports published the results of testing 85 common supermarket and fast foods to see if they contained plastic. The study found evidence of plastic in as many as 85 foods. Yes, and how many of the 85 foods? So unfortunately, oh, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately zero is not one of the choices, which is what I wish I could um, answer with this question. So yeah, the <clears throat> options are 14, uh, 20, 24, or 25, 64, or 84. So we'll give it a couple more seconds for people to answer. All right, still coming in. Okay, so we're a little bit more split on this one. So um, about uh, oops, about. 11% of you said 25, uh, a third of you said 64, and a little over half of you said 84. Yeah, unfortunately, the correct answer is 84, um, which was pretty distressing to read when this report came out. So um, you can, this was just released in the last couple of weeks. You can um, Google it and find it and read more about it and, and read about the different foods that they tested. Um, and they don't know exactly how all the plastic got in, but the, the theory is that many of these foods um, are processed using plastic, so like plastic tubes or plastic molding, or they're packaged in a plastic bag, or they're packaged in a paper container that's coated with plastic. Um, but it found evidence, again, in 84 out of the 85 foods that they tested. And the one that was the highest actually was, I think it was like an Annie's organic ravioli. It was like an organic kids uh, food which made me very upset because you would think that that would be, you know, more safe um, being organic, but it just, you know, proved that 
um, again, it's kind of like in the way that these foods are being packaged and processed and all the plastic that it's coming in contact with that um, it's potentially getting into the foods. All right, so more bad news. Um, microplastics have been found in human breast milk, um, in our blood, and in our lungs. And this is irrespective of geographic location or socioeconomic status. This is truly a global problem. Um, studies have found microplastics in the placentas of unborn babies. And a recent study published by the University of Hawaii tracked the presence of microplastics um, in placentas over a 15 year period. Um, in 2006, they were found in six out of 10. By 2013, they were found in nine out of 10. And in 2021, they were found in 10 out of 10 of the uh, women that they studied. So these microplastics and nanoplastics are coming about in a variety of ways that we are looking to understand. Um, and researchers are still asking questions. For example, this one, um, from the Hawaii study, one of the researchers said, the big question is, as it, the plastic is traveling through the placenta, can it get through the umbilical cord and then to the baby? We don't know that right now. Um, so we don't know the answers to some of these health questions that, um, at, and the impact that these microplastics are having on our bodies. Um, we're still learning about this while they're continuing to literally rain, snow, and blow all around us. So remember I said that plastics are fossil fuels, which are combined with different chemical additives. And while plastic is stable, it is not inert. So these microplastics, which are all around us, are le continuously leaching these materials into our food web and into our bodies. And this is my third takeaway, and it's the one that is the most important for, to me. Um, plastic is potentially harmful to our health. Um, as I said, there are over 13,000 known different chemical additives in plastic, but very few of these have been tested. And of those which have been tested, we know that more than 2,300 are chemicals of concern. Some of these are highly toxic and include known, carcinogen, known carcinogens like um, the vinyl chloride that I spoke about a few minutes ago. Um, other chemical additives act as endocrine disruptors. And endocrine disruptors are problematic because these are chemicals that can mimic or confuse our endocrine system, and our endocrine system is what regulates our hormones. So almost every major organ in the body, like our brains, our hearts, our kidneys, our pancreas, and our reproductive organs are regulated in part by our endocrine system. You may have heard of some of these endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, there is the famously banned DDT. There is BPA, which was banned in baby bottles, but is still allowed to exist in many other types of packaging. There's also parabens, phthalates. Phthalates was the chemical that was um, found in the food study I mentioned, PFAS, and many more. <clears throat> because people are typically exposed to multiple endocrine disruptors at the same time, assessing individual health impacts is difficult. Now, I am not a medical professional, and I'm not here to tell you that the takeout container you had for lunch or with your lunch is going to, to make you ill. However, the research is clear and becoming clearer that endocrine disruptors are linked to a variety of health issues. Endocrine disruptors have been linked with developmental, reproductive, neurological, and immunity dysfunction, and other problems like obesity and hormone-sensitive cancers. All of us in this room probably know or have been impacted personally by things like infertility, miscarriage, ADHD, autism, autoimmune disorders, or cancer. A recent study came out at Duke University that just links nanoplastics to the prevalence of Parkinson's disease. Another study came out just last week, this is February 7th, um, that links plastic chemicals to premature births. So I keep, I know I keep saying a recent study, a recent study, um, just about every single one of the studies I'm referencing tonight, I found in the, within the last three months. So research is emerging almost daily that is demonstrating time and time again that this plastic material is not as benign as we think. All right, Chris, I have one other polling question related to this. Um, could you read it for me, please? Absolutely. If everyone can just scroll down to question number three, a recent study found that the U.S. public health costs associated with plastic in 2018 was blank. 149 million, 249 million. Apparently, I put, we put 149, oh, 149 billion. I cannot read anymore. Apparently, my brain is just out. And 2.49 billion. 
there's a lot there's a lot of big numbers a lot of zeros with all of these so yeah all all big numbers all not numbers that i would want to be spending on uh plastic related health costs so and this also um was something that came out uh, just in the last couple of weeks. So if you want to do some further reading after the Zoom, you can look it up. All right. So we still have a couple answers coming in, kind of split on this one. This one's a little more tricky, I think. All right. I'll just give it a few more seconds. Okay. So um, the correct answer is, which about uh, a third of you got correct, is $249 billion in one year um, that was associated with uh, US, public health, U.S. public health costs associated with plastic. So just to put that into perspective, um, the amount of money globally that was invested in cancer research over a five-year period um, between 20, 2016 and 2020 was 24 billion. So we could have invested one tenth of the amount that we spent um, on plastic related health issues in one year, and it would have equaled the amount um, that was invested in cancer research in a five year period. So this is a tremendous amount of money um, that is going to deal with um, or take care of health problems that are is being created in part by a material that we have created and um, you know put out all over our, our world. So um, one example that hits really close to home for me is in the kitchen. Just about every week, I make what my kids call mommy's famous chicken soup. In fact, we had it for dinner tonight because it's quick and easy um, and they like it. So I shop at Trader Joe's um, and these are literally pictures of the ingredients that I buy. And I try to buy organic veggies and meat because I want to make something healthy um, for my family. But guess what? Everything is packaged, as you can see from the photos, in plastic which is really frustrating when you're a parent trying to make healthy food for your family. And you read headlines like this, food packaging is full of toxic chemicals. Um, it is known that plastic food packaging is made with chemicals that contain these endocrine disruptors. And what is not known fully, but what researchers are racing to find out is what the long-term impacts of this will be on our bodies. Because of these negative health impacts that I see as a parent and a concerned member of my community, I wanna ask everyone listening tonight, is something so pervasive, permanent, and potentially harmful to our health, which we are essentially powerless to effectively recycle, worth the risk? Do you think it might be worth re-examining our relationship with plastic? We have never lived with this amount of plastic and this level of exposure to these chemicals before. We are the test case, and we are producing too much plastic and there is too much at stake, literally our, our health and the health of our loved ones. So we need to refuse and reduce the amount of this material in our lives. How do we do that? All right, let's all take a deep breath because I just gave you 30 minutes of plastic pollution. Um, so now we're gonna spend the rest of the time talking about uh, community solutions. We're gonna get to the good news. All right, so. Deep breath, look at this nice picture of the ocean. I think it's actually uh, capturing some, uh, some plastic out there in the ocean and we'll get to the good news. So good news number one, this is a relatively recent problem, as I mentioned. Remember I said that the production of plastic has doubled within the last 15 years. Well, that's less time than Taylor Swift has been making albums. And for any of you non-Swifties out there, that's also less time than the iPhone has been around. Now, it's hard to imagine a world without the iPhone, and I am sad to think about a world without Taylor Swift. But my point is, we got ourselves into this, which means we can get ourselves out. My second piece of good news is that there is consensus pretty much across the board that being this wasteful is distasteful. Based on a 2022 poll conducted by Ipsos, 8 in 10 Americans favor local or state government policies to reduce single-use plastic. Yes, nearly 90% of Democrats and over 70% of Republicans actually agree on something. This should be a major cause for celebration. Um, they also favor national policies at about the same rates. So we all agree, we must take action. But what is going to be the most effective? All right, well, I, like many of you, have been told that I need to do my part. 
I need to carry a reusable water bottle, bring my bags to the store, skip the straw, pick up trash, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is actually a picture of me doing a trash pickup in Glen Ellen. But the problem with the individual approach is twofold. One, it puts the onus on us to fix this massive problem. But if you think back to me making my soup, I didn't ask for any of those items to be packaged in plastic. I only want the ingredients. However, it is now my responsibility to figure out how to dispose of or recycle these items. And remember, I said we can't recycle our way out of this problem. So hear me loud and clear, this is not your fault. Um, the other reason that this doesn't work is the sheer volume of this global problem. Yes, doing our, our part to reduce plastic is the right thing to do. Um, and I applaud many of the plastic uh, cleanup solutions out there, but that is not going to fix this. Another two tons of plastic entered the ocean in the time it took me to read this sentence. So think about it this way. If your bathtub was about to overflow, you wouldn't bail it out with a spoon. You would turn off the tap, right? So the action we need to take then becomes clear. To stop plastic pollution, we must stop making especially single-use plastic. I know that is much easier said than done, right? Well, the magic will lie in collective action, policy changes, and legislation. And one of the key strategies is to implement a type of legislation known as Extended Producer Responsibility, or EPR. This makes manufacturers responsible, either financially and or operationally, to manage the end life of the products that they make. Um, basically, this means you make it, you take it, or you have to help deal with it when uh, people are done using it. So a strong EPR bill is key. Get it? Key? That's why I use these cute little plastic keys so you, you all remember. Um, it's key to making real change in how we manage plastic pollution. So some of the key components of EPR legislation include reducing packaging, increasing the amount of recycled content in packaging, and increasing um, infrastructure to improve recycling and reuse, as well as reducing um, toxins in packaging so we reduce our exposure. Illinois has actually had um, some recent success last year implementing EPR legislation, and uh, there are some other things that we're working on to address different environmental issues. I'm gonna talk about those for a few minutes. So one component of EPR is to implement reuse and refill stations at retailers and Illinois did just that. They passed um, HB 2086 last year, which went into effect in August. Um, it allows individuals to bring their own containers for to restaurants for filling or refilling with ready to eat foods. Um, now, I will caveat this by saying that while the Illinois Department of Public Health has put out guidelines on this, um, it's available on their website, I don't know how widely it has been communicated with county health departments or with restaurants. And it's also optional. Restaurants do not have to participate in this. So something that you can do, um, since this is relatively new, you can bring your own container to restaurants. Um, I recommend it especially for leftovers because uh, you now they will bring you a box for your leftovers. Um, but you can do it for your leftovers. And you can also ask your local restaurants um, if they know about this and if they're planning to participate. If not, why? And um, you can share that feedback with me and a group that I'm working with. Uh, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Okay, um, another uh, key component of EPR is no burning of plastic waste. So there are some terms out there like chemical or advanced recycling, waste to energy, uh, pyrolysis. Um, these all mean burning trash, and this is extremely toxic, and it most often takes place in communities of color. This has to end full stop. Um, so last year, Illinois defeated, there was a bill, um, HB 1616, it would have allowed, it proposed pyrolysis, aka trash burning plants to skirt the Illinois EPA's normal permitting process. So that one was stopped. However, um, there are other plants that are um, being planned or discussed for Illinois. There is a lot of money in um, advanced recycling because plastic manufacturers are uh, trying to look for ways to continue to perpetuate uh, the recycling and um, and put their products out there. So it's something that we need to keep an eye on. Okay, another uh, EPR strategy is to eliminate single-use non-recyclable items like polystyrene foam foodware, um, also known as styrofoam. So this is a picture of me and some of my fellow uh, League of Women Voter Illinois colleagues. We were down in Springfield last year 
um, speaking to our representatives about HB 2376, which would have banned foam foodware at all retail establishments, including restaurants. So this was introduced and passed out of the House in the spring of 2023, um, but it's stalled in the Senate. So something you can do related to this is to ask your reps to support this bill. Um, styrofoam is not recyclable curbside. It's also made with styrene and benzene. Siren is a known human carcinogen, so we really want to try to get rid of some of the worst of the worst offenders of single use plastic and styrofoam or polystyrene is definitely one of those. The last component I'll touch on briefly is um, of, of EPR is to increase recycling and reuse, which Illinois is aiming to do with a recycling refund system, also known as a bottle bill. Um, if you don't know what a bottle bill is, you've probably at least seen on beverage containers this, these state names and um, redemption values. So um, SB 85, uh, the beverage container refund law, which has been introduced this year, um, would create a bottle bill or recycling refund deposit system in Illinois. There's 11 states that currently have bottle bills and the recycling rates in those states is higher than the other 39 states without bottle bills combined. So it really works to help increase recycling and 25% uh, of communities in Illinois do not have curbside recycling. So you can, um, it has not been uh, assigned yet, but you can call your reps and ask them to support this legislation. All right, so besides making our own calls and sending emails, we also need collective action to spread the word. Um, now I know this slide is a little busy, but the point is there are many ways you can get involved on either a local, a state, or a national level. So I'm part of Go Green Glen Ellen. Um, there is also, a, you guys have in your community, Palatine Cool Cities. Um, there's a number of these Go Green or um, community environmental organizations um, in the Chicagoland suburbs, and we all share information through this Go Green Illinois network. So I've included some contact information there. Um, this is also this grassroots education advocacy. This is where I know the League of Women Voters really excels um, because part of the League's mission is to educate and empower voters. And we have to educate people about this plastic pollution issue. So whether you're a League member or not, although I encourage everyone to join because the League is awesome, um, you can help get involved with this effort. You can email the League of Women Voters Illinois Climate Group um, here to find out more information. Um, I'm also part of a group called the Coalition for Plastic Reduction. This is a membership uh, based coalition throughout the state of Illinois, different environmental groups and organization working to reduce um, single use plastic pollution in Illinois. And we have different working groups. We're working on um, reuse. We're working on polystyrene. We're working on the bottle bill. It's a fantastic group. So again, if you want to get involved at the state level, um, you can contact me to learn a little bit more about CPR. Um, and then also Beyond Plastics, which is a fantastic national organization that um, puts out a lot of great events and trainings about single-use plastic pollution. Um, so in fact, uh, I learned quite a lot from them um, and helped me get uh, prepared for this training. So I've included their website as well. Um, basically, it just depends on you know what interests you. But all levels of contribution are welcome. And you can also join just to learn so you can be more educated yourself. Uh, on these issues. That's how I got started uh, five years ago. And now I'm, you know, so happy to be here sharing my knowledge with you. So I really encourage everyone to, to get involved. So I'd like to end with this photo that I took while running the Big Star Marathon in California last spring. Um, I compare long distance running a lot to working on this plastic pollution problem because it's very hard work. And there's a lot of days where I just <laughs> do not feel like doing it. Uh, but I know if I put one foot in front of the other and I keep going, that I make progress. Um, I never regret going for a run. And I know that even though this work will be hard, that we will not regret working towards a world free of plastic pollution. As Inger Anderson, the executive director of the UN Environmental Program said, the world is ready to break its addition, addiction to both fossil fuels and plastics. There will be withdrawal symptoms, but once the transition is over, we will all, the private sector included, be happier, healthier, and more prosperous. Thank you. I'll turn it back to Chris. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. That was a lot to, to chew on. We do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, we will go through that. Um, I believe we do have some time to, to answer these questions. Um, I'll just start kind of at the top here as, as we go through each one of these. Um, so the first question we have, 
uh, is from Laura Davis, um, noting there was a program I saw this past year when plastic bags, which are deposited at the local grocery stores, are tagged and then followed to determine if they are really recycled. The journey showed that they were mainly trashed. What is happening now with single-use plastic bags? Um, that's a great question, Laura. And I saw the same um, study. If, if people didn't see it, um, uh, it was a story that was put out by ABC News last May. Um, so what has happened now is that there was a online uh, directory um, that said that basically told you where you could drop off plastic film. That's what uh, the technical term is for these bags, uh, grocery bags, dry cleaning bags. They called it plastic film um, where you could drop it off to be recycled. The owner of that website has since taken it down. Um, because she said that there wasn't enough transparency from the industry um, that she felt comfortable sharing that information any longer. So there is a company called Trex um, that does collect plastic bags uh, that they use to make uh, composite decking, and she references them on their website. So um, my recommendation on this is if you um, can uh, go look up Trex and find out where they are accepting their plastic bags, that would be a great place to take them to get recycled. But it's definitely not um, as widely recycled, I think, as unfortunately we were led to believe. When you say Trex, is that like T-R-E-X? Yes. Do you know? Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I can type it into the chat. Sure. T um, thank you. Um, and then moving on to the next question from an anonymous attendee, uh, more of a general question of just how does plastic end up in the ocean, right? So from your trash can or your recycling bin into the ocean, what are we looking at? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, and I think especially in the Midwest, we're like, well, we don't live by the coastline. So, um, you know, it's not as big of a problem for us. Uh, first of all, over 11 million pounds of plastic um, ends up in Lake Michigan every year. Um, so the problem with how plastic ends up in the ocean, there's a couple different ways. So one is like you saw um, me picking up uh, plastic and trash around town. Um, if I don't, if that doesn't get picked up, it can wash into storm drains and go into waterways. Um, you know, for us in this area, it would probably go down through the Mississippi and then end up in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, also, when I was speaking earlier about um, waste colonialism, um, there's a stat that's commonly cited that I think there's uh, about 10 rivers in the world, and they're mostly in Asia, that contribute to the majority of the plastic pollution problem. Um, but of course, these are in countries that do not have the type of recycling infrastructure that we have in the U.S. Um, to deal with this plastic. So this, the waste just simply cannot be captured. Um, and that's uh, how it ends up getting in or how a lot of it ends up getting in the ocean. Um, another way is people just dump it. Um, there's a great book called Plastic Ocean. Um, and he talks about that. There's like, you know, ghost or uh, fish fishing nets and all sorts of stuff that's just discarded. Uh, from both. So there's a lot of ways, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good overview. Um, less of a question, but a point of information from Peg, who does know that there is biodegradable plastic now. Um, I guess a, a way to turn this into a question would be, do you know of kind of what portion biodegradable plastic is of the entire plastic ecosystem that we're seeing? I would assume it, the numbers are a little bit less than than the full plastic portfolio. Yeah, um, that is a good question. I know that there are a lot of plastics that kind of claim to be biodegradable um, or claim to break down. Um, I have not personally seen those, um, so I can't really speak to that. I think it also depends on the conditions, um, but anything that's made with plastic or, or you know, any plastic that's claiming to be biodegradable that's made with plastic, um, I would still want to know if it includes like some of those chemical additives that I talked about in the program. Great. Um, let's see. Um, from Jan Dowd here, I no longer purchase laundry detergent in plastic bottles. For example, Tide, I now use Earth Breeze sheets. A friend of mine said they would never use Earth Breeze because there is plastic in the sheets and it goes into our water systems. Is this true? I don't know if you're familiar with Earth Breeze. I am. My mom uses Earth Breeze and she loves them. And she was so excited that she got them. Um, so, Jan, this is a great question because I have read that there is, um, I think it's called PVA, uh, polyvinyl alcohol, in these laundry detergent sheets, which is a type of microplastic. Um, so, 
I guess what I would say on this is it's really hard because as I spoke about during the program, there is plastic everywhere. And often we are just, we just, we just have like two, like, you know, not great, um, two, two hard options. I personally think it's better to use something like an earth breeze sheet than to buy a Tide laundry detergent jug. That Tide laundry detergent jug represents a ton of plastic. Not only that jug itself, but like the emissions and, you know, transporting um, all those heavy jugs. So, um, you know, I, I view this as like a journey and um, we, we are going to have plastic in our lives. That's just the reality of the world that we live in. Right. So do the best that you can. Um, I think if you're using earth breeze, that's great. And if you want to, you know, switch in a little while to like a powder detergent or a liquid detergent in the aluminum bottle, um, you can email me and I'll give you some, some recommendations there. Great. Thank you. Um, it looks like in the chat, we do have one comment from Teresa Grinning, who mentions that they are an education coordinator for the Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County. As an FYI to whom asked, there is no biodegradable plastic. I'm assuming this more means like there's nothing that's truly biodegradable in the sense where it's just gone. Um, but some more discussion in the chat for those of you who want to go more in detail to that. Um, but we do have two more questions left. We are hitting at 8 p.m. Um, so we'll, we'll get this moving. Um, Another question from Laura Davis. There are lots of studies you have referenced regarding health issues. What activities are the medical community involved in? Um, Laura, that's a great question. I don't know the answer, unfortunately. Um, I think there's, you know, they're putting a lot of information out there, but um, one, uh, I, I, I will send you some information after <laughs> the call. Um, I do know, uh, just from my own personal experience, I work with medical devices. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of efforts um, from companies, both because of FDA regulations um, and from European regulations, especially if there's a global company and Europe is much strict stricter with things like reducing BPA, PFAS, and all of those types of uh, chemical additives. Um, there are efforts to, if they are in medical products, remove them, um, especially single-use medical products, um, or because sometimes for sterile purposes, like something's gonna be going into an operating room, um, you have to prove uh, with documentation and studies that the presence of this chemical is actually medically necessary mm -hmm. and that the medical benefit greatly outweighs um, the waste that's being produced from it. So there are things like that, just as um, some e extra information. Awesome, thanks um, Janet. <laughs> yeah, um, and then let's see. Two more questions here. Uh, can other can I take my own container to any restaurant to bring back my leftovers, or do I have to check with the restaurant first? Is there a website for this to see which restaurants participate? So that's another great question. Um, so what I've noticed recently uh, since COVID is that oftentimes if you're getting le your leftovers to go, is the restaurant will bring you a box. They don't take it back and box it up for you anymore. Um, so I've taken it, taken my own container and just box it up and nobody says anything. Um, you can ask. There is unfortunately not a website um, on this yet. That's something that I'm working on with, a, um, not a website, but we're trying to create a directory with that group I talked about, the Coalition for Plastic Reduction. So hopefully um, that's something that will exist in the future. But I appreciate this person um, making that effort. Great. And then our last question, uh, from another anonymous attendee, uh, DART in North Aurora takes polystyrene for recycling. Is that an effective method of recycling? That's a great question as well. Um, and that's kind of a tricky one. I know that in Glen Ellen, we offer um, styrofoam recycling or polystyrene re recycling as part of our recycling extravaganza. Many communities do this. Um, I will just say with uh, polystyrene is, like I said earlier, we know that it's made with these um, car carcinogenic uh, chemicals. Um, I am not totally sure what happens with the polystyrene when it's, um, when it's taken to DART. So I know that they collect it um, and communities are collecting it for them. I would not recommend driving it to DART. Uh, I don't think that the emissions outweighs driving it to DART, but um, I think we're gonna have to kind of just wait and see a little more on that one. Great. Um, all right, and we did just get one more question. I am going to cut it off after this, so we can <laughs> we can uh, wrap up here. Uh, I love the enthusiasm. All the questions that are coming in. Thank you so much for making this, you know, a very interactive um, uh, meeting today. So Absolutely. from Linda, we have our refill shops becoming more common. Does the uh, bring your own container pave the way for refill stations and grocery stores? 
Uh, Linda, that's a great question. I wish I knew the answer. I know we have like a refillery in Glen Ellen, and I think there's a couple in Chicago. I don't know if they're becoming more common or not, but um, hopefully they will. <laughs> All right. Once again, thank you so much, Jacqueline, for your time and expertise today. We really appreciate it here from the Schomburg Library. Thank you so much for the technical infrastructure to help you know, run this series event. I do just want to mention for everybody who's enjoyed today's topic, this is an ongoing uh, civic series, um, and we do have our next event coming up. Let me pull this here on March 12th, which is uh, Women in Politics. Um, so the, another part of the series, which is a joint between the Schomburg Library and the League of Women Voters Palatine. Um, thank you all so much for coming out and engaging. Um, Jacqueline, once again, thank you so much for your presentation. It was excellent. Um, thank you, Terry, for kicking us off here. And um, I will also move the floor over to our League of Women Voters Palatine area president, Kathy Cortez, if you'd like to add some additional words here. Uh, just another big thank you to all of you. Thank you uh, again to those of you who've attended. Um, two things on that. If you are not a league member, uh, Jacqueline, I appreciate your putting in a plug for uh, joining the league. There is a lot of good stuff happening in uh, in the local leagues and, and at the Illinois level as well. And um, uh, aside from that, uh, Jackie mentioned or Jacqueline mentioned a lot of uh, different legislation that may be coming up in the spring session here over the next couple of months. So pay attention to your voters from whatever league you're in and anything that you're getting from League of Women Illinois so that uh, she can point you in the right direction to uh, do your advocacy with your representatives uh, on these issues that are so important to us. Thanks again, uh, everyone, for attending. Thanks. Good night.